All right, so hey, happy Easter. I'm so glad that you're here today on this Easter Sunday. My name's Jeff Warren, and uh, it is my great privilege to be the senior pastor here. I have a message for our entire church family today. So we've had a great time of worship, and uh, the day is not yet over. If you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, you can turn to John 14. That's where we're going to end up ultimately be in 1 Corinthians 15 a little bit. But uh, hey, before we dive in, I want to ask a question. Uh, lots of young uh, families here. How many of you have, um, let's say a one-year-old or younger, so people can see you just raise your hand, at home right now? One-year-old or younger, okay? So first Easter, that's always fun, uh, but you're tired, right? Um, we're going to be praying for you. I, I remember back when, uh, well, how about this? How many of you... Um, have twins. Anybody have twins or multiples, as they're called? Triplets? I know we have some. Uh, Stacy and I, some of you know that Stacy, my wife, and I have twin daughters and, and a son. Um, when our girls were born, okay, they were, they were less than one, but when they were newborn, we brought them home to um, our little house. We had a little nursery that we had, uh, had used this kind of Noah's Ark theme because they came two by two, right? And so we had two uh, cribs and then a, a rainbow I painted on the wall that went from one crib to another. Now, for a while, when they were really newborns, I mean, little, uh, they, they would sleep in the same crib for a while. And finally, they got old enough to get in two cribs. But I put a, um, a sign, actually a, a verse, on the door of their nursery, of their little bedroom. And the verse was out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 51. It says this, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed. <laughs> we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We did not all sleep with two at home. That's why I'm asking. It is tough when you got twins going at it. We used to call it tag team sleeping. One would sleep and then tag the other one, then she would sleep. But uh, we shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Listen, it goes on. You're saying like, what? What, is this? what does this mean? Listen, I tell you a mystery, Paul says. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. That means just like, like you're blinking your eyes. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, you've got a sense, even if you don't know this passage or don't know the Bible, you've got a sense here, probably, right, that this, this has something to do with life after death. He's referring to life after death. He says it's a mystery. He's saying it's hard to grasp. This is hard to comprehend, but it's been revealed. It's a mystery, and now it's been revealed. In fact, this whole chapter, he talks about really life after death. And he's saying this may not be easy to grasp, but here's the thing. Everything, there, there's coming a day. How about this? In the resurrection scheme of things, I'd say it this way. There's coming a day when everything that is perishable is taken off the shelf and everything that's imperishable is put back on the shelf. There's coming a day when all of eternity, the way the Bible says it, all things are going to be made new. And it all starts with Easter Sunday. All right, now I say that there's only been one Easter. Y'all know that. I mean, really, there's only been one resurrection. Everything else follows. And every Sunday, not just once a year, but every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. It's why worship flipped from Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday with the early believers. But the question I want to ask today is the question we've been asking throughout this series. But again, if you're if you're if you're new today, I want to, I want to just challenge you with a question that we've all been wrestling with a little bit. What does the resurrection, what does Easter have to do with my life today? Because you see, Easter is hearkening back to uh, an historic event. What does Christ's resurrection have to do with my life this month, you know, this week, today? The fact that he rose from the grave 2,000 years ago, how does that impact my life today? And does it really impact my in the here and now? And how does it impact my eternal life? Life. So how can I live in light of the resurrection? Maybe that's the, the core question today. Well, Jesus was, the Bible says, the first fruits of the resurrection. Look at what it says, 1 Corinthians 15. This is that same uh, chapter, verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, it says, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now, now hang with me here for a moment. We're, 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 we're launching out into eternity. But Christ being a first fruit, First fruit means he was the first of its kind. 
He's the very first one, the best one and the first one. So he's the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning that every person who then receives his grace, okay, follows after him. We're going to talk more about that. But we then follow in this long procession of those who are following him in resurrection. Easter Sunday is a big deal. Resurrection Sunday means that all people who receive his grace by faith will find themselves one day resurrected as well. People ask me, you know, well, what will heaven be like? Or how about this? What will our resurrected bodies look like? What will I be like? Listen, you'll be like Christ. He's the first. He's the prototype. We will be like him. And when you look at him risen, this is what's so cool about the, uh, the passages where he is after he's been resurrected. You can see him. They know who he is. He has a body they can touch. See, here's the thing. People think we're going to be off in heaven with disembodied spirits floating around uh, in, in clouds or something, playing harps. I don't know. Some people think, well, we're going to be angels. No, we're not going to be angels. Angels are one thing. Humans, all right, then resurrected are going to be something else. And we're going to be like him. And, and so Christ is the first fruits of those who are resurrected. So I want to talk about this today, but let me unpack it a bit before we get to really the application of all this. In Revelation 21, John receives this revelation and he describes heaven. And he says this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Isn't that awesome? How many are ready for former things to be passed away. You know, the older you get, the more you're going, man, I just want a new body, right? I want to, I want to, I want to make this thing right. And then it goes on to say, the next verse says, behold, the one who's seated on the throne. Okay. That's Christ. It says, behold, I am making all things new. So he's making all things new and that all things includes you and me and all creation. See, Revelation is about heaven and it's about the consummation of all things. I um, mean, if you don't read the Bible, you probably know that, that it's about, about, you know, eternal things and such. But we forget that it was written to real people in a real time, in a real place. And these were people who were suffering and going through pain and persecution. And John is saying, I want to equip you to live in the here and now. So, but what does he do? He says, listen, hold on to the hope of heaven. There's coming a day. I know it's tough now. I know that you feel like your body's breaking down because it is. And you know what? Death is coming. But there's coming a day for those who are in Christ, those who believe in the resurrection and what he's done for us on the cross and receive that. John is saying, listen, I want to equip you to live with hope in the here and now. And that's my hope today. All right. So on this Easter Sunday, that's what I want us to do is encourage you. You know, it was John Lennon who wrote many years ago, you know, imagine there's no heaven. Some people live that way. Um, Karl Marx is the one who said that heaven, he said religion, but he said heaven, this idea of an afterlife is an opiate for the masses, an opiate for the people, opiate being a, a sedative. It's just heaven just puts you to sleep. And what he means is if you just live towards heaven, then in the here and now, he believed that the belief of heaven actually let the rich off the hook. And you know, he was right, a misunderstanding of heaven. This idea that, you know, we're going to go off to heaven. So uh, a misunderstanding of heaven is why people misuse the earth so much. It's like, well, you know, this doesn't matter. What matters is off into eternity. And, and people, as if to say, um, hey, we're not going to be here forever. Yes, we are. We are. And I want you to see that today. The Bible speaks of heaven coming down to earth and ultimately not God saying, oops, I blew it, messed up. Listen, God's plans are not thwarted. If Easter means anything, it means that, that the end of your story and the end of my story, the end of the, uh, how about this, his story, history has already been written. Christ, the first fruits, assures that that we are going to be resurrected and he is coming not only to renew our souls, but our bodies. And he's going to restore all things, including the earth. Revelation describes heaven coming to earth and Christ's prayer that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven will be fulfilled. God doesn't make any mistakes. 
And so what we see is a redeemed uh, heaven with a redeemed people. And Easter says, listen, if you think that all there is is today, then you're going to live for today. But Easter says no way. The resurrection of Jesus means that there is life eternal. The resurrection assures that he's coming to redeem all things. Praise be to God. See, Revelation 21, 7 um, says this. It says that only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, it says, will enter into heaven. The hymn writer, you may have heard the old hymn says, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Will you be? When the roll is called, when your name, when those names are called, will your name be called? Now, it's interesting. 80 percent of all Americans uh, believe um, in heaven. 80 percent. But but the, when you look at these studies, it shows that that half of them think they're going to get to heaven by being a, a good person, keeping the Ten Commandments or some moral law. Half of all who think they're going to heaven say, I'm going to just have to be good enough to get there. And then less than half actually believe they're going to get to heaven because of the finished work of Christ upon the cross and what he's done for us. What Easter is all about, which I want to unpack here in just a bit. One out of four Americans uh, confess they have no idea how to get to heaven at all. And and, and then what's interesting, 71 percent of Americans also believe in hell. All right. Uh, so more believe in heaven than in hell. It makes sense, I guess. But of 71 percent who believe in hell, for every one person who, who says I'm going to hell, who wants to admit that, right? 120 people believe they're going to heaven. Now, this optimism stands in stark contrast to the words of Jesus that we see in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, he says. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Now, this begs the question, am I one of the few? And I'm here to share good news with you today. This sounds foreboding. This is like, oh, my gosh. Will I be one of the ones? Listen, this is why you're here today. You can know. You can know if you're going to be one of those whose names are called out. The Bible is very clear about this. Hebrews 9, 27 says every person is destined to die once and face judgment and then eternity. That is what's going to happen. Count on it. What does this mean? Face judgment. It means that you're going to die. You're going to stand before God. And and it's all that's going to matter is what you did with Christ. Whether you received his grace, all right, free gift of grace or whether you thought you were going to somehow be good enough to get to heaven on your own. One is self-salvation that leads to hell. The other is God coming to us and rescuing us from our sin that leads to heaven. Every person will die and face judgment. I like the story that the uh, woman was teaching a group of young boys in Sunday school and they're all around. And she says, so how many of you want to go to heaven? She was teaching on heaven. All but one of them raised their hand. And she said, oh, um, little Johnny, you don't want to go to heaven? And uh, he said, well, no, I... Well, I do, but I told my mom that I would be here and wait for her to come and pick me up after Sunday school. You see, here's the thing. It may not be today, right? He he thought it was today. It may not. It may be today, but it may not be today. But but listen, 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people will face eternity today on this planet. 250,000 people will face God before this day is over. The Bible's very clear about this. And this is why I'm bringing this message to you today. God wants you to know exactly what's up. You see, his big plan is redemption. It's restoration. And Jesus, his resurrection brings about the first fruit, the first prototype of all that is coming. Not just us, but all of creation. I can say it this way. You can see it there. All of history is heading toward a resurrected people living on a resurrected earth, all right? What's called the new earth, worshiping a resurrected Savior. If you have uh, received Christ's forgiveness, now let's be clear. You, when you die, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you die, you, you are immediately in the presence of God, okay? You're in heaven. But there's coming a day 
when God determines that that all of history is complete and he's he's counting the day, he knows the day. And when it's all finished, Christ is coming again and it could be any day he's coming again and it's closing time. There's no there's no decisions that are being made at that point. It says the Bible says that those who are dead in Christ will be raised. They receive their resurrected bodies. Say, OK, so even those in heaven, those on earth, we receive a brand new body, regardless of how you died or how long you've been dead. You receive a resurrected now eternal body and all of earth. Heaven comes to earth and we live forever in what's described the new heavens and the new earth. We live forever. He didn't he didn't scrap his plans again. God's plans are not thwarted. And if you think that he's just going to like destroy the earth, uh, it's just going to blow it up and be done. No, God is going to restore the earth. It's going to be perfect, just as he intended originally in the garden. Perfect earth, perfect people worshiping a perfect God where sin and death has been destroyed because of what Christ has done on the cross. We are all looking for that day. And when that happens, heaven and earth will be united and Christ's prayer will be fulfilled, will be answered fully when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. But even now, as we follow him and live for him, we can be a part of ushering in. We say it this way, ushering in his kingdom, even in our lives today. And he wants us to live this way in light of heaven. God's eternal plan will be accomplished. He will not be defeated and the cross proves it. Now, listen, when you do the math on the information I shared earlier, here's what's interesting. You realize that somewhere around 35 percent of all Americans have a biblical understanding of what it means to actually get to heaven, how you get to heaven. Uh, Billy Graham was noted as saying uh, on on several occasions, he said about 70 percent of all people who are in our churches. And I mean, like all churches uh, in America, 70 percent. Uh, don't even know Christ, not even Christians in a biblical sense have not received Christ. Now, they're cultural Christians. Evidently, they go to church, so they do it as a cultural thing. Right. But they've not they've not received Christ. And so today, before we go, I want to be very clear on this day of days, this historic day. I want us to be very clear about how we get to heaven and you will be faced then with the decision, the greatest decision of your life. And I'm hopeful that you will receive Christ and every person can settle this today because you can know, you can know where you're heading into eternity. You see, we shouldn't be surprised by all the data and what I've just shared that, that, that Christ's words about the narrow way are true. He's just echoing Proverbs 14, 12. It says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. The intriguing thing about that verse is not that it, the, that it leads to death. But there's a way that seems right. There's a way to get to heaven and there's a way not to get to heaven. And Jesus is very clear about it. So here's what I want to do. Ask the big question. How do you get to heaven? All right. That's the key question today. You will forever know the answer. Right. What is the way? Or I could say, how can I have this life? It's called Zoe, the Greek word, abundant, eternal life now. How can I have that? How can I live an eternal life now? So John 14, uh, begin with verse one. I'm going to read this. John 14, verses one through seven. All right. The, let's let's hear from the one who's actually came from heaven. How about that? And has come to take us back to heaven with him. All right. Jesus himself. Listen to this. John 14, verse one. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now he's here with his disciples just prior to going uh, to the cross. They've had the the, the final the, the Lord's Supper, they have now entering into these final moments together. And as he's saying to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Clearly, they were troubled. Uh, they knew something was up. And he said, believe in God, believe also in me. As you believe in God, believe in me in the same. I am God. Believe in me as you believe in God. In my father's house are many rooms. Now he brings this kind of language that we can understand. Okay, there's a lot about heaven we don't fully understand or can't see, but we can do more than just imagine because he gives us pictures and Revelation gives us pictures. So he says here, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I love this. He's, He's the one who's preparing this for us. Wow. 
That is awesome. Verse three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to to myself. Okay, so he's coming again. I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? That makes sense, right? If you don't know the destination, how, how do you know? How, we're gonna, how do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. He's saying you haven't fully grasped what's up here. If you had known who I really am, then you would know the Father as well. He's already said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And then he says, from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. We've seen God. He's saying, you've seen God in me. If you've seen me, you've seen him. Now let's break this down. How do you get there? Okay, first of all, heaven is a prepared place. You saw that. It's a place, all right? It's a prepared place. It's a physical place. See, contrary to popular opinion, again, we're not going to be floating around like ghosts uh, up in heaven. We're going to know each other. We're going to be fully alive. We're going to know each other as we have. Re uh, our relationships will continue on and we'll have new relationships. We're going to have resurrected bodies. People say, well, heaven's going to be boring. I've heard that like like because we have this image. We're going to be maybe maybe a long church service. We're just going to be singing songs. I'm not a singer. We're going to be heaven's going to be. Listen, heaven is not going to be boring. Here's why you're in the a couple of things. You're in the presence of God. God is not boring. All right. Christ has prepared this place for us. Not boring. How about this? You're not going to be boring because you're going to have a resurrected body. Your spouse, your boyfriend or girlfriend, not going to be boring anymore. All right. Because you're going to have a resurrected body, no sin, no death. And we're going to be in this, gosh, unending love for one another. We're going to be discovering new things. We're going to be seeing what God has done. We're going to be worshiping him with our whole lives. Everywhere we turn will be in awe. And truly in heaven, every day will be better than the day before. The Bible describes it this way. And the tension that we see, though, this is what a lot of us don't understand. The tension that we see is not so much here to there. Instead, it's more now to then. Because you see, God is, is, is making all things new, and that includes all of creation, a new earth, which will now be our eternal home. So on our best days, the most beautiful spring day that you can see, I want you to imagine the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Just a shadow of what is to come. But it's a shadow. We can with a redeemed imagination, we can see and sense what it will be like to be on a new earth, completely perfect as it was originally designed in the garden before sin destroyed it all. OK, secondly, look at this. Heaven is not at the end of every road. Like any place that you go to, you don't just jump in the car and any road's going to get you there. It's like... Um, you know, people think all religions point to the same God, lead us to the same God. No, they don't. Simple contradiction, a, a law of contradiction, um, simple logic would tell you that's not the case. You don't need the Bible for that. Two opposing views can't both be the same. Contrasting views can't be the same. Only in Christianity do you have Christ coming, God coming to us to rescue us. Every other religion on the planet is us trying to get to God through our good works. They're not the same. And, and there's only one way. Not all roads lead to heaven any more than if you're planning a vacation to Hawaii, you don't just jump in the car and start driving, hoping that we're, we're going to get there probably in the, in the end. It's not going to happen. And in the same way, some people approach heaven that way. They think that, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to just going to kind of drive around till I run out of gas. And that's the way most people live. Never finding the way. But thirdly, look at this. So this means that heaven is not our default destination. Now, you know what a, a default is. That means you don't get there automatically. A default is something like on your computer. If you don't take an action, it just defaults to a particular setting. Or it's uh, maybe a law, you know, that you take no action and it's something that's required by law. Right. So some people have, think heaven's that way. I'm just I'm not going to do anything. Perhaps I'll end up there. I don't know. 
And again, more, some people spend more time planning uh, their summer vacation than they do planning for eternity. Friends, don't, don't let that be you. You can settle this. You can know this. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, the soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. You see, in the end, no one wants to go to hell, but nobody goes there automatically. You must know that Christ has made a way. If you think that you just kind of go there automatically, you have completely disregarded Christ's horrific death on the cross. You completely re- disregarded Easter Sunday and all that it stands for. If you think that somehow you just go there automatically. Listen, Christ is either everything or he's nothing. I had a guy tell me, he said, Jeff, listen, many years ago I was having this conversation. A guy said, uh, hey, listen, here's the deal. If you're, if you're wrong, man, you've given your life uh, to a lie. You have believed and, and been living a lie. And I said, no, no, no. If I'm wrong, right, then if I just die, I'm going to be unconscious. It's not going to matter. I've lost nothing. But if I'm right, you've lost everything. If you do not receive Christ and enter into eternity, you will live apart from him forever. So Christ, he's everything or he's nothing. There's no in between. This is why the resurrection is such a big deal. It is why Jim Elliott said, uh, the, the, the young missionary martyr, he said, uh, he is no fool who, who will give what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. To give our lives away to him and, and to live for him. See, and here's the deal. You can know and you must know before you die. Because you don't know when you're going to die. You need to decide now. First John 5, 13 says, These things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you might guess or hope for or cross your fingers. That you can know. Well, what are these things? Well, things like John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So fourthly, heaven is found through Christ alone. Heaven is found. This is what Jesus says. Notice that the way to heaven is not a religion, but a person. Praise God for that. Right. Jesus said, I am the way. And again, we have to admit this is an audacious claim. It either places him uh, in an insane asylum or it places him on the throne of the universe. You've got to decide. He made these claims. How can Jesus claim to be the only way to heaven? Well, because shortly after this, after this statement, he ends up taking on the punishment of the world, the perfect lamb of God, living the perfect life. He dies on the cross, taking upon himself our sin. He's buried and he's raised again so that we might also receive him by faith, receive his grace and his forgiveness and follow him, the first fruits of resurrection, that we might also end up in heaven with him. You see, your sin separated you from God and it demanded payment. But because he's so loving, God delivered payment in the person of Jesus Christ so that you and I could be forgiven. It's why Christ said on the cross, it is finished, done. I've said it often. You know, religion is spelled D-O. It's what you must do for God. But Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It's what he has done for us. That's why I said it's finished. So, friend, here's the thing. I want you to to settle in today and just realize you can know that you have eternal life. It won't matter what you have in your bag. All that will matter is your name being called. If your name is in the Lamb's book of life, that's all that's going to matter. And it will be there if you receive His grace. So I want you to turn back to, look at this, or, or let's look again. You can see it on the screen there. Uh, back to the, to the passage I started with. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's interesting that uh, he's referencing death as sleep. You see, because there's coming a day when all things will be made new. We're, uh, we're fully alive and awake. Uh, and, and it says here, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the, the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, 
Then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Now he quotes from Isaiah and Hosea. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. That is to say, you can try to be good enough, but it's only going to lead to death. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So Stacy and I, uh, we didn't get a lot of sleep, um, but our girls were changed and they grew up. And I remember not too long after that, they were probably one year old, maybe two years old, I guess. And we were out in a double stroller, probably at two years old, uh, in the neighborhood walking around. And we went down the street, turned, went along the way. And I just decided I'd start messing with them. So um, I asked the girls, they're there, Whitney and Emily. And I said, girls, do y'all know where we are? And they're like, no, they're just looking at squirrels, pointing out stuff. I said, well, do you do you know where our house is? And, and they said, nope. And I said, oh, no. How are we going to get home? You don't know where our house is. You don't know which way to go. What are we going to do? And then uh, I think it was Whitney. Um, she said, Daddy, you know the way. You know the way. You see, my girls knew that all they needed to do was just sit back, relax, chill, because daddy knew the way home. You see, in a real way, I was the way home. They simply had to trust that I knew the way and I was going to get them there. They just had to relax. And I'm just challenging you today, friends. Listen, get off the treadmill. Relax. Rest in the finished work of Christ. He's done all that needs to be done. We can rest in him. We don't have to keep striving to determine our worth by our good works or, or trying to own more or establish ourselves or be better and work harder. Instead, he's calling us to believe more deeply what he's already accomplished for us on the cross. Easter means. Of all the things that it means, it means that our future story has already been written and all you've got to do is receive it. Trust him to get you home. He is the way. So receive his grace today. And as we close our time, I just want to challenge you. All the wrongs will be made right. Everything will be redeemed and everything will make sense when he restores all things, including you and me and all of our relationships, our families, everything will be restored by him as we enter into eternity with him and the door upon which we've been knocking all our lives will finally be open and we'll see him face to face all because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together as we close. I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes and it's your prayer before God right now. So you pray. I want to ask you, have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you, have you been touched by His Spirit today to say, I need to settle this today? And friend, you can know, you can believe. Give Him your life by faith. Believe what He has accomplished for you. It is true. And you can be set free from your sin and feel the burden, the weight of being good enough, the weight of your sin can be taken away from you. And you can just sit back and trust the One who has come to rescue us the risen Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give Him our lives today. He is worthy. Worship Him with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.